We continue to look at the war in Ukraine. We're joined by Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School, great-granddaughter of former Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev, recently wrote a piece for Project Syndicate headlined, Don't Cancel Russian Culture. Explain, Professor Khrushcheva. Hi. Uh, thank you. Well, it kind of goes, I think, with the theme of this program. Uh, is that Russia outside of Russia and Russia inside of Russia. Um, I think we spoke on this program about about this even earlier, that uh, if there is an onslaught on Russians indiscriminately, indiscriminately, if there is a demand to have collective responsibility, if there is a cancellation of concerts or uh, now it seems to be getting better, but taking off uh, uh, Tolstoy's books or other Russian writers' books from the shelves. Uh, Ukrainian uh, authorities are now canceling all Russian culture, including their own Ukrainian-born Nikolai Gogol, who was a great Russian writer of the Ukrainian descent uh, and, quite, and, in fact, was quite critical or very critical of the Russian imperial system and corruption and so on. So it would be useful to read, in fact, for the Ukrainians. And so when there is all this uh, cultural humani humanitarian onslaught and canceling uh, athletes and sportsmen and others on Russia, it actually legitimizes Putin's regime because it does feel and it does appear that uh, what he does saying, I am trying to uh, protect us from uh, from the others who want to cancel us. In fact, it gives it validity. And therefore, my argument is don't cancel Russian culture because it plays into Putin's hands and punishes Russians collectively. And they will be the victim of that. And then they will also blame the West more than they blame the oppressive regime that is there in Russia or here in Russia, because I'm in Moscow right now. And, Nina, what about the fact uh, there have been uh, several reports of Russia itself cancelling Russian culture? In other words, uh, there are theatre directors in Moscow, uh, multiple theatre directors who've been uh, fired, other artists and musicians who've been forced to flee the country, uh, not able to perform. What, what are you hearing about that? Absolutely. And I think that goes hand in hand. So uh, when Russians are being canceled by Russia, and your previous guest was talking about this, is just the whatever uh, semblance of opposition. It's not even opposition that all these theater directors that are now being fired. In fact, a lot of theater directors who created the theaters that they're being fired from, which is even during the you know, great times of the Cold War after Stalin, not during Stalin, but uh, during Khrushchev, for example, uh, even the oppositional theater was allowed to exist. I mean, there have been critics, there have been uh, screams by Khrushchev himself, but they allowed to continue to do, uh, to do their work. And so now it's all disappeared. So for the Russians who stayed, uh, it is problematic because they're being oppressed heavily by the state, by the KGB state that is now in full bloom, that basically the repressive machine uh, that is uh, uh, probably even pairs with the com being compared to, could be compared to uh, to the Soviet days and also being canceled elsewhere, which, by the way, was not the case during the Cold War. Then Russian culture was welcomed because it was understood that it could be used as a tool against uh, against the Soviet regime. So absolutely. And, and it's, you know, one of the cynicism and sort of this horrible doublespeak of um, of the authorities of the Kremlin is that, for example, uh, the uh, Jewish repatriation agency Sohut is now having difficulties and issues because they spoke against the uh, the war uh, in Ukraine, and now they're being liquidated or called to be liquidated in Russia, and yet. Uh, the, and one of the reasons is because they're supposedly responsible for the brain drain. So Russia 
kicks out, pushes out everybody who is the best and and the brightest and the most the most great thinkers. And at the same time, it blames others for uh, for this kind of repressions. So it is a double whammy. It's a it's a you know between the rock and the hard place that Russians are now uh, finding themselves in. And Nina Khrushcheva, you're in an unusual position. You're often in New York because you teach at the New School, but you're in Moscow now. And uh, of course, you're Russian and the great granddaughter and adoptive granddaughter of uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Um, what has most surprised you that we don't get here, that your understanding, as you spend time in Moscow, of people's attitudes, including this latest astounding figure of the U.S. saying 75,000 Russians have died in Ukraine? Uh, well, I am. I, I'm, not, I'm not often in New York. I'm often in Moscow. I actually live in New York, so so that's that's important. And unlike others, I actually decided I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to come to Russia and see indeed what's happening because we read a lot of how it is and how people are afraid. And you know, as Sergei Lavrov, Russian foreign minister, said, "Well, we'll see." whether we will, you know, now reach out to the West, because there are all these other options. And you spoke about it with previous guests, his trip to uh, to uh, Africa and, and other places. So I wanted to see, and what I found really remarkable is that uh, this pivot to not the West or whatever, whatever Russia is pivoting towards is really the Kremlin idea, but it's not the Russians' idea. And I haven't seen any pivots, because I've been uh, walking around looking for some Sino cafe or Sino restaurant or something, China, something, something. And it just continues to be all this uh, Western formulas that, that is part of Russian history um, in museums and everywhere. So it is uh, a very strange reality is that uh, Russia withdraws itself from its European history. And at the same time, it is part of the European history. Uh, the bizarre experience, which I thought I would I would see, but not to the extent that I actually did see it, is this, the war is going on. People are uh, cite the war as the, uh, the most uh, reason for their depression, and they're over 50 percent are being uh, being depressed, and, you know, all these troops are dying. At the same time, there is some idea of uh, they try to keep the idea of semblance of, of normalcy, the semblance of normalcy. So they go to restaurants, but the mood is of such despair. I've never ever in my life, and I've grew up in the Soviet Union. I've never in my life felt that there's just a dark cloud uh, falling uh, falling over Russia and all these great patriotic stories that come out on Russian TV, sort of the happy and wonderful, and we're just going to defeat all the enemies. Um, I lived in double speak world. I live in this. Um, kind of early in 1984, but I never experienced, I do feel like I'm in dystopian fiction myself, and I just pinch myself every day thinking that I need to wake up because it can't be real.